Good morning, everyone. This is Leon Zito with the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Davis. We're excited to have you join us today for the webinar, Applications of Integrated Energy and Emissions Modeling Tools. Our speakers today are Dr. Randall Gwensler and Anne Lee. Dr. Randall Gwensler is a professor in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. After completing his undergraduate degree at UC Davis, he worked for the California Air Resources Board for seven years obtaining an MS in Environmental Engineering and a PhD in Transportation Engineering from UC Davis along the way. At Georgia Tech, he has managed more than $21 million in transportation, energy, and air quality research, including a recent $3 million in Department of Energy ARPA-E Transnet project, which included regional transportation simulation and real-time incentives to change travel behavior and reduce energy use. Dr. Gwensler is a member of the Transportation Research Board's Managed Lanes Committee and a former chair of the TRB Committee on Transportation and Air Quality. He teaches undergraduate courses in environmental impact assessment and sidewalks and graduate courses in transportation planning and transportation energy and air quality. He has served on a variety of National Academy of Sciences, U.S. Environment Protection Agency, and coordinating research council committees and panels charged with assessment of vehicle emissions and identification of research needs. Anne Lee is a PhD student in the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Georgia Tech. She is also receiving an MS in statistics from Georgia Tech this spring. She earned her BS in GIS at Tongji University, Shanghai, China. Anne has worked on multiple research projects at Georgia Tech related to vehicle energy modeling and GIS applications in transportation. In her dissertation research, she is developing models that can be used by transit agencies to generate optimal long-term bus fleet turnover plans with a focus on switching from conventional to alternative fuel buses. Following the presentation, we'll have a Q&A session where you can uh, put, we'll pull audience questions from, uh, for our speakers. If you have any questions, please submit them in the Q&A window by clicking the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. I'll now be turning over to Dr. Randall Gwensler. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to start out for uh, the first section here, probably about a half an hour, going through the variety of uh, energy and emissions modeling tools that we've developed uh, through the NCST partnership, the National Center for Sustainable Transportation, uh, and then have refined over the last few years in working on this Department of Energy RPE project. Uh, and then Anne, at the end of that, is going to uh, talk about the applications of these tools within uh, her dissertation framework, uh, looking at, at transit fleet optimization. Uh, we'll talk a bit about uh, the systems model um, that, that we applied in the RPE project, uh, and then the specific tools that were generated in order to estimate energy use and emissions uh, within that model and, and with other models as well, uh, which include MOVES Matrix, uh, the Georgia Tech Fuel and Emissions Calculator, uh, the Personal Vehicle Operating Cost Calculator, which is online. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that, but we'll give you the link if you want to play around with it. Uh, the Integration of Grade, we'll talk about that a bit. And then the applications that, that came out of this and in being able to rapidly apply these tools to travel demand and, uh, and activity-based models, uh, dynamic traffic assignment, VISM, and, and other simulation models. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about uh, TransSim, uh, Transit Sim and Roadway Sim, uh, the simulation models that we've developed. Uh, for the Atlanta metro area, um, and it's a uh, case shortest path type approach. Uh, and then the applications with monitored uh, vehicle activity will be in there as well. And then uh, finally, we actually just presented uh, the AirMod grid uh, screening tool, the first cut at, uh, at using these tools uh, kind of at the regional level to uh, do worst case uh, scenario analysis for pollutant concentrations. Uh, so we'll come back and talk about that a bit as well. So the integrated modeling system that we developed for the RPE project, it, and it was a, a requirement for these projects that uh, we do a couple of things. Number one, that we, uh, that we do modeling, simulation modeling of a region of four uh, million or greater, uh, and that it had to have simulation uh, included in that. Uh, and that uh, we were looking at, at integrating a lot of the new types of, of activity data that are available out there with respect to Navigator. AirSage was one of our partners. Uh, we worked with INRIX data and then second by second data from other monitoring sources. Uh, and then all of that kind of culminates in what we call the space time memory. And I'll come back and talk about that at the end of the, of the project uh, or the presentation here. Really what we're going to focus on is the tools that were integrated with this entire framework 
Uh, and before I leave this slide, I, I want to mention that we did another one of the requirements was that we had to be able to interact with the user community. Uh, so we did that with a uh, an app, uh, Android-based app. Uh, that allowed us to uh, indicate how much time, uh, how much uh, distance, how much cost and energy use was associated with a variety of trips. And we'll come back and, and show some slides that, that demonstrate that. So before we talk about MOVES matrix, we should talk about the MOVES model for a second. This is the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's Motor Vehicle Emissions Simulator. Uh, it is the model that is required to be used for uh, federal analyses for things like conformity and regional transportation planning and, and uh, emissions inventory assessment. Uh, emissions in this model are defined as a function of speed and vehicle specific power. And it's a, a real change from the previous modeling framework where uh, an average speed emission rate was, was uh, the, the way things were done. And you can imagine that the average speed on an arterial when you're moving 20 miles an hour at free flow are very different than the average speed on a freeway uh, where you're in stop and go traffic that can range from five miles an hour to, to 45 or 50 miles an hour. The vehicle specific power approach um, uses a binning uh, approach to essentially uh, assign vehicle activity into operating mode bins. And then for each of those operating mode bins, there are emission rates that go along with that activity. Uh, the little equation on the top is the VSP equation. Uh, without getting into any details, it, you should note that it does include velocity and it does include acceleration. It does include grade and then it has a set of vehicle parameters. And, uh, the papers that we've got out on, on the MOVES matrix approach kind of goes into the detail of how MOVES works and how, how we've been working with that. So the MOVES model actually translates your model inputs into this vehicle, uh, or sorry, VSP framework. Uh, if you have a driving cycle or you, even if you have a second by second uh, speed versus uh, time trace, uh, you can bring that into uh, and calculate VSP for those, um, those operations. Uh, and then, in, and that's actually what's going on inside the model. It's taking your inputs and applying uh, driving cycles and uh, estimating the fractions in the operating mode bins and weighting different driving cycles inside. And then uh, when it has your bin matrix, it, it basically looks up the emission rates and you get your, uh, your results translated back into the outputs that you need for emissions inventories or for uh, microscale dispersion. And uh, these, uh, this slide has intentionally small lettering. You're not supposed to be looking at all the details here, but the important things to note is that there are 23 moves operating mode bins. So your vehicle activity is translated into a percentage of idle mode, uh, a percentage of, of uh, coasting and deceleration and braking, and then three different VSP modes for three different speed regimes. So zero to 25 miles an hour, 25 to 50, and, uh, and greater than 50. And so you can see that what we have here is you calculate the VSP, uh, you then uh, look at the speed, and then you have the operating mode that the vehicle is operating in. The emission rates that go along with those VSP bins are, are uh, provided here in this slide. You can see this is for a 2016 model year passenger truck in the year 2016. Uh, and you can see that the emission rate on the vertical axis is in grams per second. And we have these three speed regimes uh, from zero to 25, 25 to 50 miles an hour, and 50 and greater miles per hour. And as you move along from, uh, from idling coast and, and that up the VSP regime in each of these speed uh, ranges, you get an increased uh, energy use and increased CO2 emissions. And the best way to demonstrate that is um, with the little uh, application that we developed. It's on the, the Moves Matrix website, uh, which shows how the, you know, the results of pairing uh, a driving cycle VSP bin histogram, so this is saying that uh, 250 or so seconds of operation is, is down there in idle and 350 seconds in the next bin. And so you've got your allocation of vehicle activity across those bins. Uh, and those just are simply multiplied by the appropriate column uh, over on the right-hand side for the CO2 emissions rate uh, per VSP bin. And so the animation uh, is, that we're showing here is uh, the uh, essentially the, the FTP driving cycle. Uh, being displayed second by second as you're moving uh, in time uh, and speed. And down below, you see that the accumulation of vehicle activity in terms of the number of seconds of operation within each of those operating mode bins. So even though the range goes from zero to 40, it's 23 different operating mode bins. And you can see the highlighting here is, is showing you the, the bin frequency. And down on the bottom line, you can see the uh, second by second speed, the second by second acceleration, uh, the current energy consumption, which is the result of, of that multiplication, uh, the total distance traveled, and the total trip energy. And so this is a, 
a nice way to, to look at any kind of driving cycle to see what kinds of activity are falling into uh, the higher BSP bins. We use a similar approach with respect to eco driving, which um, I've left out of this presentation, but you can imagine that uh, if you can keep these vehicles from going into the higher VSP bins, uh, the, the higher range within each of those speed ranges, uh, that you can reduce the energy use and the emissions associated with the vehicle activity. Uh, we did that for uh, transit operations as one of the NCST reports. And uh, the bottom line was that we, in looking at the MARTA vehicle fleet in Atlanta and the, uh, the Greta Express bus fleet, uh, the savings from just eliminating the very high speed operations and those uh, those pretty harsh accelerations uh, from the monitored data uh, would get about a 4% fuel uh, reuse reduction for the fleet for the year, which is very significant when you're talking about a transit fleet. Uh, and it would come at a, at a very minor cost uh, in that you do drive a little bit slower overall and you do arrive at your final destination, which would uh, typically a MARTA rail terminal in a, a little bit of extra time, but nothing would push you out of the existing uh, schedules that we have. So we looked at that as being a pretty un, inconsequential impact, a 4% fuel savings and your buses are still on time. So applying moves, um, if, you, if you look at the overall moves model is quite challenging when you have complicated and, and dynamic networks. We have a 75,000 link uh, transportation network in the travel demand model. Uh, a 200,000 link network that we use in the simulation models. And so uh, if you want to represent the differences in driving conditions on those roadways and the differences in what the fleets look like on those roadways, because they're very different um, in the morning commute, you don't tend to drive your older vehicles, you're driving your newer reliable vehicles on the freeway. And so the model year distribution tends to be newer on the freeway commute than it does on the arterials in the afternoon. So. Being able to, uh, to analyze a wide variety of conditions on the roadway and for a you know, larger networks, smaller networks, um, regions, uh, metropolitan planning organizations and, and planning regions uh, tend to create their own lookup tables anyway to support their modeling. They're gonna apply a driving cycle or an average speed to a facility type and then say, well, we got this percentage of these facilities that are operating under these conditions. And we're gonna use the uh, default uh, county fleet for this county and the default county fleet for that county. Uh, by the time you start multiplying all those different uh, you know, combinations that you might use, uh, it makes a lot of sense to create a lookup table. And so the, the concept of moves matrix really um, was generated years ago when we, we did this with mobile. Um, is why not just pre-run all of the different combinations of input data that, that you would have, that you could potentially use, uh, do it on a, on a distributed computing platform, a supercomputing platform, iterate across all of those input combinations, and then generate one giant, massive, multidimensional lookup matrix. Then you have your lookup tables for any event that you would want. So we did that. Um, Moves matrix essentially uh, processes iterations that include uh, the county, uh, calendar years, one-year intervals from 2010 to 2024, uh, five-year intervals for the, the out years. Uh, we have three different fuel types in Atlanta. We have a winter fuel, a summer fuel, and a transition fuel as the fuels switch over. Uh, we did our uh, exhaust runs in five uh, degree Fahrenheit bins. We do one degree Fahrenheit bins later, but it takes a little extra time, as you'll see. Uh, we do 5% humidity bins. Uh, we go across all of the vehicle source types. Uh, the roadway types that we're using uh, for the exhaust emissions are urban freeway and local. Uh, and then we do all the speed bins and all the operating mode bins that, that are there. And um, we do a, we have a partnership, uh, essentially it's like a cooperative within Georgia Tech. It's called the Partnership for Advanced Computing in, uh, Environment or the PACE uh, Computing Cluster. Uh, it is a partnership uh, between the faculty members and researchers and uh, some overhead money from the Office of Information Technology that allows uh, faculty and research staff uh, to access uh, the, the computing cluster and to run distributed computing applications. Uh, there's more than this now. There's 35,000 cores at the time we were doing most of our, our work on ARPA-E, uh, 90 terabytes of memory, two petabytes of storage, and of course, um, nobody's supercomputer looks like that. Ours looks like this. Uh, and if you uh, wander around, you'll see rubber ducks and, uh, and Linux penguins uh, perched on the computers. Uh, but this is the way it actually actually looks. And it is a good it is a good supercomputing cluster. Now, that said, I should tell you also that there are 35,000 cores available. Uh, we get 80 of them, um, plus any cores that are not being used at the time when we're trying to make a request. 
so you know this is a, a well used uh, distributed computing system. So to do Atlanta moves runs, to do all of those different combinations, you need to run moves 30,000 times, um, and that shouldn't be too surprising. You can multiply each of those factors together. It does take about 20 minutes to run moves per, uh, per run. So you can imagine that uh, it would take an awful long time if you had a single computer. It takes us five days in pace with 80 or more sustained cores uh, to do a, uh, a moves matrix application. So we would consider the moves matrix application for Atlanta to be one of those runs for the Atlanta metropolitan area. Uh, you generate um, 5 billion emission rates. Um, so it's a very large lookup table and it's about 120 gigabytes in terms of the lookup array. Um, so, of course, you need to figure out, well, how do we process that array when we need to apply emission rates? And um, the way that we do that is we, we take this massive matrix, the regional matrix uh, represented by the little cloud there, and for um, the applications that we're going to run, um, we will look at the regional inputs to say, well, what calendar year do we want to look at? Let's only pull the sub-matrices for that calendar year. Uh, what's the fuel, the inspection and maintenance program, the meteorology in terms of temperature and humidity? So we pull those sub-matrices, and then those sub-matrices we query with a set of Python scripts uh, for the specific uh, link data in terms of the speeds of operation or the driving cycles of operation, uh, the distribution of the source types uh, where we look at uh, light-duty automobiles, light-duty trucks, heavy-duty trucks of various types, uh, the VSP and the operating mode bin. So we're, we're querying that sub-matrix, which makes it a lot faster to work with. But you can imagine, if it takes five days to run Atlanta, that it might take a long time to run the nation, and that would be true. Um, there are 22 different fuel regions, and you'll notice we don't iterate across fuels. Uh, we iterate across three Atlanta fuels for Atlanta. And there's 89 different moves, inspection, and maintenance scenarios that are implemented across the United States. And that, that leads to 117 unique combinations. Um, we have run, uh, I think it's about 28 to 30 uh, different uh, regions, so 28 to 30 of those 117 regions. Uh, and the blue uh, area shows what areas uh, we currently cover with respect to completed moves matrix outputs. Uh, that was as of, uh, I believe, yesterday. So um, it would take us an awful long time on our cluster to do this. Um, but that's not to say that it can't be done, and it can't be done relatively quickly. So let's take a look real quickly at the uh, Oak Ridge National Lab's Titan supercomputer. Uh, they have 27 trillion calculations per second, about 300,000 cores, and 710 terabytes of memory. Uh, they can do processing a lot faster than we can. So even if they were to allocate 1% of their, of their cores to this run, um, they should do, they'd be able to do um, one region in less than eight hours. Uh, it really would be uh, not terribly long to knock out the entire United States. Okay, so that's great for on-road emissions, but we haven't talked about you know, doing regional emissions inventories. And one of our big projects over the last couple of years was to upgrade moves matrix to integrate the start exhaust, truck, uh, hoteling operations, and evaporative emissions. And we leave the refueling emissions to uh, the stationary source sector. Those emissions generally tend to occur at the stationary source, so we, we're not including those in what we're doing in our regional inventories. Um, and we finished that, and we demonstrated that you get exactly the same results um, in this process when you apply uh, these matrices uh, instead of um, running moves each time, because essentially you've run moves through all of the different combinations that you need to generate the start, hoteling, and evaporative emissions. And we did this uh, for Atlanta as the case study. Uh, un unlike uh, the on-road emissions, there's about two million runs that need to be done because you have all of the exhaust, start condition, evaporative, and hoteling emissions across all of these other variables. Um, it generates uh, 100,000 millions, billions, 437 billion emission rates, about a 5.5 terabyte matrix, and it took us about 25 days with our allocation. Um, you know, one region in Titan, though, would take about 1.8 days, again, using the cores, 1% uh, of the cores. So we believe that this is something that, that could be done uh, over time. Uh, the R squareds are, are the straightest I've ever seen, 0.0001% um, difference. So that's, I mean, we're talking decimal places of a percent difference, and that really only has to do with the rounding errors that are going on in the, in the saving of the data. Uh, and this is the case both for the on-road emission results as well as the regional results. So before we leave the uh, modeling tools and, and go to some of the applications where we've applied the, uh, these tools, I want to talk just briefly about the fuel and emissions calculator. The fuel and emissions calculator is open source. It's available online. Uh, we have a spreadsheet uh, version. We have an uh, online 
uh, <clears throat> excuse me, plug and chug Python uh, interface. And this this model was really designed to do two things. And it came along at about the same time as we were move, working on Moves Matrix. So we wanted to be able, um, and it was originally for transit fleets, developed for uh, Federal Transit Administration with uh, a partnership with Oak Ridge. We wanted to be able to do two things. We wanted to be able to represent um, the, the full life cycle costs um, and the pump to wheel and well to pump uh, emissions and energy use and cost for these transit vehicles. But we didn't want to just use average uh, values for emissions uh, and energy consumption. We wanted them to be responsive uh, to the on-road acceleration and speed uh, profiles. So essentially what we did is we combined the moves matrix components for the transit vehicles as part of the, of the fuel and emissions calculator. And uh, we, for everything else, we basically used GREET. So we brought the GREET model together with the fuel and emissions, uh, with the uh, uh, moves matrix to create fuel and emissions calculator. And all of the calculations are done in an open spreadsheet. You can see how absolutely everything works. Uh, and you can, um, we use this actually in classroom uh, operations for uh, group um, projects and for, uh, you know, to capstone type projects for energy and emissions classes. Uh, it, it works quite well. And I think one of the most important things is because it's all open source and you can see how everything's running, um, you can also change anything that you want to, um, and if you want to change different assumptions that are going on inside the model. So you can imagine that this can be applied um, after or in coordination with Moves Matrix. Uh, and you can pick up the, uh, the upstream well to pump uh, emissions from greed and then the downstream uh, disposal of those vehicles as well. The other uh, calculator uh, tool that we developed is the vehicle cost calculator. Um, it's again online and this is looking at lifetime ownership and operating costs. Uh, things come out in a cent per mile uh, uh, allocation which you can then use in your modeling uh, and uh, it has data feeds from the US EPA uh, that come from the certification database on um, things like uh, the fuel economy and certification standards and that. The US Department of Energy, uh, the Georgia Department of Revenue on vehicle costs, and it includes both the fixed costs for the vehicle purchase or lease, financing, insurance, license registration, and the variable costs with respect to uh, the on-road fuel use, depreciation, maintenance, uh, parking tolls, and, and even car washes can be in there if you want to put them in. It's a really user-friendly format. Um, you basically plug in the information about your make, model, and year of vehicle, uh, and then if, it, if there is a choice between, say, diesel or gasoline, you get to choose that, uh, the type of hybrid. Uh, and then there's some dots there on the left that show that we've got a lot of other variables associated with how did you finance your car, how much did it cost when you purchased it, uh, how long are you willing to own this vehicle or operate this vehicle in, in miles before you dispose of it and get a new vehicle. And all of those uh, calculations all the way down through are, are going to give you your cent per mile run, uh, your output for that vehicle. And so for my uh, Subaru Forester, it's 47.6 cents per mile uh, with no car washes and no parking and a variety of other assumptions. Um, and you can see how those costs are broken down uh, in the, in the um, pie chart here. Uh, depreciation is always the largest component. Um, interest, if you're paying interest, fuel, uh, the fuel costs are broken down into the county taxes and the state taxes and the federal taxes. Uh, insurance, you have a, a variety of um, assumptions that you can make um, from averages for, per state or you can plug in your own. Uh, smog check costs, all those things are here. And so we use this in the RPE project for uh, the various vehicles when we were, uh, we would return the uh, energy and emissions calculations and we would add to that uh, the cent per mile operating cost as well. So with that, I'm going to turn to the Moves Matrix applications and the fuel and emissions calculator applications that we did. Um, and this is going to be fairly quick. We're going to wander through some uh, regional travel demand model uh, use, uh, corridor scenario analysis, uh, simulation applications, uh, microscale pollutant modeling, and uh, some of the app-based uh, individual modeling. So we applied Moves Matrix 2.0 to the Atlanta Regional Commission, um, their travel demand model, the activity-based model. Uh, we get the outputs in terms of where those trips are and how many trips are made, uh, everything down at the household level, and then the allocation of the of the trips to the roadway network, uh, a 75,000 link network. And I should note before I move on that your network is really important. And um, we have three different networks that we worked with that the Atlanta Regional Commission had been using. Uh, one is their planning network, the one that's inside the travel demand model. Uh, one was the high resolution network that they were planning on moving to. 
uh, with the model that includes uh, dynamic traffic assignment, the, the prototype model. And then what we think they probably will end up settling on, which is a consolidated uh, link model, which uh, is more refined than the 75,000 link network, but doesn't include all of these access points uh, that were represented in the large network. No matter what you do, you have to make sure that your networks can talk to each other. And so if you're doing VISIM modeling and regional travel demand modeling, you have to have some underlying base network that, that coordinates. So applying the, the um, Moves Matrix 2.0, um, we can generate the on-network emissions. Um, in, we've got the VMT on the left, the hydrocarbon emissions, PM 2.5. They can be broken down uh, by hour, by peak period, by total day, uh, as well as the off-network, the starts and parked vehicles and, and, uh, and emissions that go along with that. Uh, I've cut out a whole bunch of slides that are available in the paper that's referenced on the bottom here. Uh, you can look at all kinds of charts and figures about um, the types of vehicle activity and what they're generating. And then you can look at the activity-based emissions uh, by source, uh, by the uh, EPA modeling source. So it's essentially a full application. It can run in background. It does uh, take advantage of, uh, of distributed computational power. Another application that we did was an assessment of the HOV to HOT conversion in the Atlanta metro area. It was along 85, I-85 moving south. And what we had was a, a managed lane, HOV, three plus uh, occupancy, uh, I'm sorry, two plus occupancy being changed to a HOT lane where you could keep going for free if you had three or more uh, individuals in the uh, carpool, uh, but you had to register. And, and uh, if, it's, if you only had two people or uh, wanted to drive alone, you would pay to do that. And so this scenario resulted in a variety of changes. First off, you had a complete change in the operating characteristics of both of those because there was the HOV lanes were running congested before we did all of this, and now they're uncongested or, or fairly uncongested for most of the day, the vast majority of the day. And the general purpose lanes, you had other vehicles shift in there, which meant that you changed the operating characteristics and you changed the fleet, uh, the fleet composition. And these managed lanes are good because that lane is carrying more vehicles uh, now than it did before, which means you're actually relieving traffic on the other lanes. You're not pricing people into those other lanes. Um, so these can be very effective uh, managed lanes. The, the new ones that we're building are not conversions. They are uh, dedicated lanes that are reversible. And um, we can look at the changes in the operating mode characteristics. You remember those uh, those operating mode bins. Uh, the general purpose lanes are, are operating very different than those managed lanes are. And so the modeling tools that we've been talking about, when you apply the fleet and apply the operating mode distribution mix, uh, you can look at the emissions that go along with that. And we did that in the paper in uh, 2017, and we're getting ready to do that again uh, right now for the reversible lanes. In terms of microscopic simulation, um, the you know, car following and, and weaving and all of that built in, uh, we work predominantly with VISM, although the tool will work with other uh, models. Um, we developed a series of Python scripts that essentially run VISM for a defined network. Uh, they, we retrieve the vehicle trace data out of the COM interface, so you've got to interact with the, the VISM model. Uh, you assign the source types uh, to that, so it's a combination of what VISM assumed the source type was and how we match that with uh, the source type in moves. Uh, we process the second-by-second second, uh, data for that vehicle to VSP and then match the, uh, the bins with the energy and emission uh, rates for those bins. And then we just essentially append the energy and emissions uh, data to the trace data and put it back through so we can visualize it again. And uh, this is actually what it looks like. Um, this is the um, interface uh, for Jimmy Carter Boulevard. We have the simulations running. Uh, you can see them going red in terms of the emissions rate, which tends to happen uh, at the stop. Uh, stop bar areas uh, for acceleration. And um, the, you could actually track the vehicle classes in here too. If you can see the little dots, there's some, uh, some diamonds and stars for buses and single unit trucks or triangles. So this is the essentially just playing back the output out of VISM. So we've used this quite a bit with respect to the VISM model. And uh, the first application of AirMod was with those data um, in that region, looking at Jimmy Carter Boulevard. Uh, and doing the CO concentrations. And you can see that we're running from 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, to so the hour of the day uh, playing back. And so we get these concentrations that can be used for a variety of purposes. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. So that leads us to the, the big application that we just finished, which is an AirMod screening analysis. And so think of this as 
uh, an air mod analysis like I just showed you for Jimmy Carter Boulevard, but now we're going to have every um, uh, link in the transportation system interact with every receptor um, that we would want to look at. Uh, so we're going to run this for the entire region. And the way that we process this is to try to get the worst case pollutant concentrations where you have the highest emissions, select the highest emissions mass flux coming off the roadway, and then apply that with the AirMet. Uh, data file so that you get the kind of the identification of what those uh, emissions would do uh, under those hourly concentrate or those hourly wind fields. Uh, we have a method for automatically processing uh, the network to get us the air mod uh, cells that we need, uh, the little polygons that go over the roadway. And then you'll notice that we uh, came up with a methodology to um, to put more uh, higher density of receptors near the major roadways, and then the density uh, drops off as you move away from those roadways. Uh, for the Atlanta metro uh, area, the AirMod grid study for PM 2.5 is, is illustrated on the right. It's a, a thousand roadway miles um, broken down to highways and ramps. We have not brought in the major arterials into this yet. Uh, about 5,600 polygon segments and 54,000 receptors uh, dropped over this. And this was a seven-day pace modeling run. And this was a brute force modeling run. We did um, not care whether or not the receptor was... Uh, downwind or upwind of the link. Um, so there's a lot of trimming that we'll be doing in our processes that we're, <clears throat> excuse me, we're working on right now. And you can see that the gram per hour per meter squared per link is, is illustrated. This is the playback from the simulation. Uh, and then you can see that, that we're, you know, we're seeing the, the differences associated with the traffic volumes and the, and the vehicle fleet. And we take the final results of those um, outputs, so <clears throat> excuse me, the highest concentrations across uh, all of the, the receptors, and we can plot those out and identify areas where we might want to do a little more refined uh, modeling. And uh, we can take these seven-day runs. We believe we'll get them down uh, to uh, hourly runs by the time we're through. Uh, our ultimate goal is to be able to have this application running uh, for the travel demand model so that as travel demand model scenarios are being run and the outputs are being delivered that we can process those outputs to get the emissions and energy use as well as the pollutant concentrations for the region. <coughs> Easy. Uh, the last area that I'm going to talk about before we um, transition over to Anne's uh, bus project is um, this space-time memory that I alluded to at the very beginning. Um, space-time memory is uh, essentially a way of thinking about the, the travel network um, in, in a multidimensional space. We're, we're looking at space and we're looking at time, and time is elapsing in this uh, graph going from 810 to 815 to 820. And the concept that we brought forward in the RPE modeling was that, you know, congestion forms in pretty predictable patterns. We see the same um, series of patterns. Sometimes they'll form along one pathway and, and release along another pathway, but it is fairly predictable if you have um, insight into how the traffic system is evolving or has been evolving over the last, let's say, hour. Um, and the, the way that to look at this in terms of space-time memory is we've got each of these, um, these columns here representing different days. So you've got a lot of historic activity that go back years. And then if you look at the congestion formation patterns uh, on the network and how they're expanding out over this peak period. And these are from, um, from representative data, as I recall, on this one. Um, going from 810 to 830, you can see the congestion is getting worse as we're moving towards the 830 uh, boundary. So if you can do a good job of predicting what the future is going to look like, say it's 810 right now, and we can predict what it's going to look like through 830, then we can do a better job of routing people through the network. It's a, what we'd like to think of as a potential solution to the 30-minute commute dilemma, where you get in your car and the navigation system tells you it's going to take you 30 minutes to get to your destination, and 10 minutes into your trip, it says it's going to take you 30 minutes to get to your destination. So we can do a better job of predicting that congestion formation. We can put people on appropriate pathway. So the pathway simulator that we've developed is roadway sim and transit sim. Uh, we took the travel demand model network, um, actually the refined network, the 203,000 link network, uh, and um, basically developed a Python program around this so that a user can input an origin destination pair and a departure time, and the simulators will find the shortest path trajectories through that space-time memory. So in other words, through this column on the right, if we're forecasting from 810 to 830, it's going to move in space and time with that trajectory as opposed to just space. Um, the trajectories then um, will account for that congestion formation, and we can do all the background calculations for energy use and the like uh, to, to see what that looks like. And so, as an example, Sandy Springs single-family home going from home to work, you've got 
two driving routes, a transit route with and without transfers, rail transit express bus, and you get outputs that look like this. The, the fastest method is a 26 minute drive straight to work trip, um, but um, you can take transit with one transfer, go from bus to, to rail, and that takes about 44 minutes, and we do the energy calculations for that as well. Uh, rail transit park and ride is almost as good as driving alone. Um, you drive over to the rail station, get on, and you can work while you're on the rail. And then uh, you don't want to take the express bus because it doesn't go where you are starting from. So it would be 94 minutes to do that. And then the, uh, the application for ARPA-E was to take those shortest path trajectories and to uh, give users the options. They could look at, well, do I want to potentially change my driving route or my departure time? Do I want to look at taking transit? And based on the click boxes that they select on the left, uh, they get a return back of the different options that they have, the travel time, the cost, and the energy use in gallons of gasoline equivalent. Uh, and so the final route that was selected for this one is, uh, is MARTA bus route 30, 36. So let me summarize and, and tell you where we're headed, and then I'm going to turn this over to Anne. Uh, Moose Matrix is uh, brute force modeling with Moose. We are running through every combination and creating a, a huge matrix that we have to then query, uh, but we've developed all the scripts for that, and they can be applied at any temporal scale and any spatial scale. So uh, regional analysis, corridor studies, simulations, and the like. And we can link it to AirMod, which is, uh, which is handy for other types of screening tools. Uh, the matrices are very, very large, so expertise in Python, distributed computing, GIS, visualization, all these other things are, are really necessary to, uh, uh, to build these models. To apply the models is not as difficult uh, because we've really created a suite of tools that can be used by the user to do that. Uh, and there's uh, big data and deep learning applications that are evolving over time. So the final pro uh, slide I have uh, before we go to Anne is that we have a number of dissertations we're working on. Um, the road grade dissertation is done integrating the hybrid and electric vehicles uh, using autonomy modeling uh, into the VSP framework is underway. Uh, we've got a transit fleet optimization model that Anne Lee is going to talk about. Uh, we're doing some distributed uh, justice uh, assessment models to look at who is driving under what conditions and how much energy they're using. Uh, and then these daily pollutant exposure and assessment tools. So the energy and emissions impacts um, of managed lanes are underway uh, as well. And we're doing a North Avenue corridor demonstration uh, where we are um, tied in with the smart corridor and the traffic signal. So we'll be, we're, we're actually doing right now the emission and we will be doing the dispersion modeling with that as well. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ann. All right, while we're getting the uh, PowerPoint queued up, well, let me go for at least one of the questions that's come in. Uh, do you have any idea about how different the results from MOVE uh, are from those that can be obtained from the MFAC web database uh, for ARP's model? No, you'll notice that California doesn't uh, appear on our map, and that's because we're doing only moves and we haven't done any uh, MFAC comparisons at all. Okay. All right. I think we're ready to switch over and have Anne, and we'll get to the other uh, questions at the end of Anne's presentation. Uh, my dissertation topic is about a framework for optimizing public transit bus conversion to alternative fuels. Alternative fuel buses have the benefits of low tailpipe emissions and have fuel efficiency. However, the adoption rate of alternative fuel buses is still quite low. Um, one of the main reasons is because of the cost. Alternative fuel buses are more expensive than the conventional fuel buses, and some of them are more expensive to maintain. If we are using the electric buses in the fleet, we need to consider their range limitations, which means we need to uh, recharge them during their operations. And we need to decide where to charge them and when to charge them, and the charging power to use and the battery uh, to use. And this brings complexity to the network. Especially in the extreme weather conditions, um, the range is even shorter. Some of the agencies have been complaining that um, their actual uh, real-world uh, fuel efficiency of those alternative fuel vehicles is um, smaller than what is expected uh, and what is claimed by the fleet manufac uh, manufacturers. And uh, if we are using the new vehicles, we need to um, do some additional work to train the mechanics, um, and this brings additional cost. And when op operating the mixed fleet, we need to consider um, the route planning of this mixed fleet and bus coordination and scheduling and the charging scheduling. Based on the uh, review of the previous studies, I realized that there is a gap uh, for optimizing models for a long-term uh, mixed fleet man management, which consider all the points listed here. First is when to purchase which type of bus and when to salvage them and the interactions between uh, the schedules, 
charging strategies and charger location and performance measures selected for optimization. And then uh, because it is a mixed fleet, we need to consider the assignment of different vehicles to service jobs and depots. Right now, we are liking a framework that can be uh, readily applied um, to a local transit agency that consider um, the data inputs and assumptions that they need to make uh, in order to make such a long-term mixed fleet management and the quantity of work that need to do for the simulation and optimization. And finally, the optimized decisions and their uncertainties. So my dissertation is going to help to uh, fill those research gaps. The first task is to identify the factors and concerns affecting agency vehicle purchase decisions. Uh, this will be conducted by uh, doing semi-structured interviews. The second is to compare the energy use and economic costs across different fuel tasks. The third is to develop a scenario-based optimization model that um, can make the fleet management plan, uh, including those points like uh, fleet purchase and salvage and assignment of vehicles to routes and depot and the charging uh, related uh, decisions, including the scheduling and location selection. And to build a network can, that can implement uh, those fleet management model. And I will uh, apply this framework to MARTA, the local transit agency in Atlanta, Georgia first, and then this network can be applied to any other agencies in the future. Um, these are the tools that I'm going to use for uh, my dissertation for the uh, fuel emissions modeling. The first is Smooth Matrix, as Dr. Gensler uh, mentioned just now. It is a rapid application of US EPA Smooth model and autonomy, which can uh, do the uh, on road vehicle energy use for different fuel types. And it is capable to um, incorporate different vehicle specifications. And it also generates the upstream uh, fuel use based on the grid model. And then the Georgia Tech Fuel Emissions Calculator, which evaluates the life cycle cost effectiveness of adopting alternative fuel vehicles. And transit sim, which is to um, for each origin destination pair, uh, it can generate the real-time routings for different uh, transportation modes, including driving only, transit only, and park and ride options. And it evaluates the energy use, emissions, and cost of most matrix and uh, FEC. For the energy simulation work, um, the battery electric vehicles, heavy electric and diesel vehicles are simulated based on uh, autonomy uh, by using the real, real world um, second by second operating data. For the CNG buses, I used a coverage factor generated based on um, most metrics. And then the energy use is aggregated to the microcycle level for each vehicle. So the microcycle uh, is uh, defined as the operations between two consecutive bus stops. Uh, in order to uh, model the um, microcycle energy use, I used uh, machine learning uh, techniques, and the features that I used are listed on the left. Uh, the red boxes are the ones related to uh, the operating cycles, and the blue ones are the vehicle specifications. When applying the models, um, the features uh, that can be generated based on um, the data sources that are listed on the left. So for the duration and average speed, it is from the uh, transit fees, uh, like GTFS data. And facility type and number of signals is from the roadway network. And the grid data is generated based on the DEM. And the vehicle weight are from the ridership and uh, the, some other few uh, vehicle specifications. And by applying the model, we can predict the microcycle uh, energy use per revenue link and per data link. And then ag aggregate them all, we can generate the fleet-wide energy use. Um, the, um, by training different models, I realized that uh, XGBoost achieves the best performance, and this will be used for the modeling work. Uh, for the optimization part, uh, this is the ongoing project. Um, I used two main scenarios. The first one is the one-time mixed fleet optimization. So the goal of it is to uh, find the optimal fleet uh, composition and operations for an existing transit agency's operations. Um, the component in the objective function are the operations, maintenance, and um, infrastructure. 
and the constraints are listed here. The first scenario is try to um, optimize the assignment of budgets to depot and revenue routes. And the second scenario is um, giving the flexibility of trip training, which means um, it is very beneficial if the transit network is big and there are a lot of frequent interlinings between different bus routes. And the routing is generated based on the transit theme. And the third and fourth scenario uh, are like um, based on uh, similar to the first and second one, but including the electric bus, which means we need to do some additional um, decisions related to the charging strategy and station selection. Um, for this optimization scenario, uh, we, we, we can obtain the optimal one, but uh, it is not readily applicable to a uh, local transit agency because even though we know the optimal composition, we still probably cannot uh, be able to afford to replace all the vehicles at the same time, uh, which means we can do it in a long-term mixed uh, fleet optimization, which considers all the variables and constraints in the one-time mixed fleet scenario, but with some additional constraints related to the annual budget and the total life cycle ma mileage and years of the budget. Since it is long-term, we need to consider some uh, uncertainties related to the policies like changes in grants and subsidies and technology improvements and vehicle technology cost and service demand. Um, that's pretty much it. And yep. So thank you very much. Um, I think we have uh, about 10 minutes for <laughs> questions. Yeah, we have a couple of questions already in right now. And I'd like to remind everybody, uh, if you have any questions that would like to ask, please type them into the Q&A window. Uh, the first question, I think this is probably more for, for uh, Randy on the general modeling, is how are you considering an automated or connected future for emissions modeling? Well, the, the nice thing about the model is you can specify any driving cycle. So as you have changes in operating mode characteristics, um, you know, for example, flow smoothing and uh, max capping out the speeds and things like that, that can be brought in. Any simulation model, if you are structuring that simulation model to do these kinds of assessments, then the model will fit right with that. So I don't think there's really any uh, constraints. The bigger picture issues for me are you know if we go to these uh, to these full automated systems, there's going to be a lot more electric vehicles, and electric vehicles are not something that are directly built in uh, to the moves model, and so that's where the additional um, work that we're doing will will add that to the framework. And then another question we have is: it seems Anne focuses on EV buses. Uh, what about other alternatives? Um, do CNG buses have similar challenges? I think they're referring mainly to uh, refueling and range daily range compared to the, the daily drive cycle for a bus on typical routes? Uh, yeah, actually CNG is considered in my uh, analysis. And also it does bring uh, some additional cost if we need to build the refueling station. It, that is also considered. Do you, does it seem like most CNG buses have enough range to get through a typical day? Or is that common or are generally a CNG bus able to refuel once a day? Uh, it is able to like be refuel like once a day. Okay. Yeah, I think the bigger issue is the performance characteristics, say, of the electric vehicles in, in Atlanta, where you've got high grade conditions under some of the areas, and you have to decide: do you do rapid charge, in, you know, at, the, at a station when you have 10 or 15 minutes of of time between runs, or is this something you're going to try to do only at night? So that's where her optimization analysis is really going to bring some things to light, I think. Um, We've gotten through the questions we, we have so far. I'd like to invite anybody else that may have additional questions. We're coming fairly close to the end of, of our time window. If I could add that um, one of the ways that we decide um, which, which region we're going to run next when we have 30 regions done is we're doing it on request. If there is an interest in running Moves Matrix or applying it for um, your region, uh, pretty much all you have to do is send us an email and we'll put you in the queue. Um, we should be uh, just about finished with Texas now, um, so we have the whole state done there. We've done Baltimore, Washington, but as people make requests in order to use it, we provide those. I guess my question is on the the, uh, the web app for optimizing commutes. Right now, it's only loca located for the Atlanta metro area? Yeah, right now it's actually turned off. The RPE okay. project is done. Um, so we have the code that we developed for 
uh, for doing that in terms of uh, the transit sim, roadway sim, uh, and the connections with the uh, with the energy and emissions modules. And then you specify the vehicle characteristic um, so that we can get the cost and uh, you know cent per mile cost into that. Um, so it's something that um, that we're hoping to continue to work on, but it's it's. The transit sim and roadway sim is the more important aspect to us because we're able to use that for our analyses, right? And yeah. we're able to do a lot of comparisons. The interaction with the uh, with the user was um, a required element of the RPE project, um, but it's not something that we're really supporting. Right? It's, it takes a lot of effort to do yes. that. Yeah. Did it seem like the the user community in Atlanta was was interested in in that tool and you got much uptake? No. Okay. <laughs> I need mean, to be blunt. It is really hard to get people to use an app um, unless you're willing to pay them. Uh, so the sample size was very small. And we sent out, I think it was 70,000 postcard invitations and advertised on Facebook and out, did outreach through the various uh, organizations within uh, Atlanta. And uh, you just, it is impossible. We, I've, I've come to the conclusion it's really, really hard. Unless you have an app that they're already paying for and or using and getting a, a value out of it, they're not gonna add another app uh, for you. So it needs to be integrated into the things that other folks are doing. Sure, we have another question coming in from the audience. Uh, they say, thank you for the presentation. Travel demand modeling framework has been focusing on passenger vehicles. In general, the modeling system, how is the future truck fleet considered in terms of emissions and near road impacts? Yeah, it's it's whatever the travel demand model is doing, and you're absolutely right. The the focus has been on the passenger vehicles and then typically a, a truck uh, a fraction is overlaid on top of that, or there's a separate truck module that, that's providing those activities. Um, it is at whatever resolution the model can provide us, we can tailor the tool so it can do the analysis. But you are kind of limited with respect to what those models are currently capable of doing. We have, I think, one of the most advanced travel demand models in, in the country, and there's still limitations with, with using that. All right, well, unless there are any last questions to come in, I think I might actually be able to end this on time. Um, Last last chance, speak now or forever hold your peace. Well, without that, I'd like to thank uh, Randy and Ann for coming in and presenting today. Uh, their contact information is on this final slide. Oh, wait, one last question came in. Uh, what are some of the resources to use, to use your model for agent-based models? Um, you basically need to have, well, it depends on what your output is looking like. If you have a, a vehicle, if you have a vehicle that's defined and you have second by second uh, speed and time, you can run it. Um, if you have uh, average speeds, then typically you're going to be taking uh, values out of the, um, uh, the moves default um, runs, which is essentially weighting two different driving cycles that are inside in, the, in their libraries. Um, but it, it really shouldn't be any any problem. It's uh, the framework and formats are all specified in the PowerPoint support files that we put out. So when a when a group makes a request for uh, their region, we send all of that, and then we we can work with them. That's part of the um, the NCST outreach that we're doing is providing some of that support um, so that we can you know get people up to and to speed and running them. Sure. All right, um, if you have any further questions, uh, Randy and Ann's contact information is listed on this final slide. You can also reach out to uh, myself, this is Colin Murphy, I'm the Policy Director with NCST. Uh, we'd be happy to put you in contact with any of the NCST researchers who are working on this or, or similar uh, subjects. Um, thank you all for, for attending and thank you for the, the great questions and the discussion that's happened. Uh, if you have any further questions, please reach out and keep an eye on your email. We're going to have more webinars coming out over the next few months. So thanks a lot and have a, a great rest of your day.